All right, welcome to the show, YouTubers. Get busy in the chat and make sure you like and subscribe. It is a Champions League Wednesday, so we have no time to waste. We got to get in and have it, baby! All right, we got a great show today. Another wild Champions League day. Goals galore, match day three with uh, Wednesday's fixtures. It was absolutely insane. Chelsea taking on groupie leaders. Milan coming into today. Sevilla and Borussia Dortmund were fighting it out for second place in the table behind Manchester City, who, by the way, should be renamed Holland City. Juventus, they were battling for the first points in Group H. Uh, it certainly was a battle for a large part of this game. And Benfica and PSG battled it out for top spot in their own group. Nigel Rio Coker and Michael LaHood joined me today. So sit back, grab a drink, relax. And if you're Nigel Rio Coker, grab a cigar and let <laughs> us entertain you because Keiko Lazzo begins right about now. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Keiko Lazzo. Ian Joy alongside my good friends. Before we get started... Michael LaHood, Nigel oh, Rio Coker. We got to touch on Nigel's uh, his comments today on CBS Sports HQ. Forget his dress code. I don't know <laughs> who on earth gave him the dress code to dress like that. It must have been Thomas Rongan. But who's more handsome, Michael LaHood? Is it Nigel Rio Coker or is it Olivier Giroud? There's well, no we question. Know who Michael's going to pick. So why even ask? There's no question. Michael's pick. There's no why question. Uh, you know what? Michael's Today, in his Kanye I, West moment. Well, He's going to pick Giroud. Mate, mate, Leave mate, Michael to be Kanye mate, right now. You don't even know what I'm going to say. I was going to pick you. <laughs> the jacket, it's always you with the kit. Giroud was crap today. I caught myself. There you go. There you go. Nigel, please Ian. explain yourself. Come on. Explain your comments hey. on HQ this morning. I'm a, a lot of people out there probably caught it. Listen, I'm a confident man. I, I have the right to be confident in who I am. Listen, I always tell young kids, if you don't believe in yourself, who else do you expect to believe in you? You start from within. The best players we, we've seen in this great game of football, they always had that magnificent self-confidence, sometimes mm. arrogant, but it worked. So if you don't believe in yourself, how do you expect anyone else to believe in you? You know, so you said the same thing. A good shout. Don't worry. You know who said you the know? same thing, Nigel? Jeru Serginho Jeru Dest once said that. Serginho you know Dest once said that too. Who? Serginho Dest. He said the same thing recently. If you don't believe in yourself, you're well, a good company. Said, we'll get on to him later on. Let's just leave him out of this. Anyway, back to Ian. That Let's go for it. played out now, mate. It, it's all about... Boys, the... it was an amazing Champions League day today. Match day three just absolutely hammered us with goals galore. And it started off in the first half. It was incredible. The earlier kickoffs, we got goals in those games as well. There was a goal in every single game and multiple goals in many of the games. Let's start with Group E. Nigel Rio Coker, I'm coming to you first because we're talking Chelsea against AC Milan. Chelsea, we're bottom of the table coming into the group. AC Milan, we're top of the group. And this is the discussion <laughs> I can't believe right here. Did that. This is the discussion <laughs> going into that That's game. That's a handsome guy. Are you kidding? Forget the game. Bit of hair. Who is sexier? Is it Nigel Rio Coker or Olivia Giroud? No, this, the shirt has to come off. There's, you know, I, I couldn't grow a beard that much, but give me five, ten years back, I had a nice hair. I could have a fade and everything. Don't worry about oh, that. Oh, mate, listen. you got, you got to go. Been, you gotta listen, go all I have to yeah. say before back, I get onto the game, years. Ian, is there's yeah, been many, quickly. many times in America I have yep. been mistaken for a certain actor <laughs> in Brown Sugar, Who? Tay Diggs. A lot of no, women no have taken me for Tay Diggs, so... No chance, no chance. This Listen, we're losing, right. we're losing subscribers here right now. we got to move on pretty quickly, <laughs> all right? Chelsea had a convincing victory, Nigel. Uh, fantastic performance from them. Not a great game. Wasn't exactly free-flowing football, but at times they made Milan look a little bit silly, especially with the goals that they conceded Milan. Pretty poor. Um, but let's get into it. I mean, what was your overall thoughts on the game? Chelsea, big win for them. They needed it. I mean, only Chelsea fans will be happy with the fact they beat AC Milan. I think for me, Milan's goals they conceded was absolutely diabolical defending. Defending at its worst that I've seen. It really was a bit of schoolboy defending from an, a prestige team like AC Milan with such history in this competition. Just wasn't good enough. Um, the game itself, as you said, for me, wasn't really entertaining. It wasn't great football. I felt the first 15, 20 minutes was both teams looked so nervous, trying to feel each other out. We've obviously heard rumours of uh, Rafael Liao being on the radar of Chelsea Football Club. So you thought this would be a great time for him to show his, his um, ability in the big stage, so to speak. And I think he kind of played himself out of a move for Chelsea. He didn't really fancy it. But the one or two times of brilliance we saw from him, we were like, wow, this kid can play and he has ability. My thing, which I didn't quite understand, is when you've got a player of that quality, now, put yourself in a coaching manager's shoes a bit, guys. 
Why would you not encourage him to be high in one-on-one situations and cheat a bit and get him mm-hmm. the ball and encourage him to take players on? The one or two times he did it, it looked effortless and it created opportunities for AC Milan. But they struggled to get the balls to Giroud. They struggled to get the ball to him. And it just literally just didn't look like anything was going. And I think when you have a player like Giroud, when it's the same thing as Vlahovic at Juventus, like Ian says, you have to have service. Mm -hmm. If you've got no service for Giroud, you're wasting his ability and talent. He got no service today. And to add to that, one of Michael's homeboys, friends, (laughs) bromances he has with Sergio Dest, he was absolutely awful today, Michael. I'm sorry. He gave Uh the ball away every time. His decision-making, his choices of runs, which I didn't understand. He's got pace. He's got Mm -hmm. ability to get forward. Stay wide. But every run he made, if you watch that game, he ran inside to close the space, which isn't football intelligence. It's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. But overall, I would say what I've learned from the two days of great Champions League football we've seen, I would say this is the reason why I think Napoli is the best side in Italy. Because out of all the Italian teams, they're the only team who I was willing to play expansive, attractive, adventurous football. I think Milan really kind of played within themselves today. They didn't give a good show for themselves. They conceded crappy goals. And it wasn't a great game of football. But credit to Chelsea. They got the job done. Because you can still see that they're in that building process at Chelsea. It's not a finished article. They're still building. But Milan didn't go hard to try and expose that. So for me, it was an average game of football. Credit to Chelsea. Chelsea fans are going to be happy. But Milan should be absolutely disgusted with themselves because they didn't really give a go of the game today. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So I just want to defend my boy, my best friend, Serginho Dest, because that's I think it's a bit harsh to pin this performance all on him. I didn't it's pin easy. it on him, Mike. It's I just said he wasn't great well, today. Nigel, you, you've you had your time to talk, Nigel. Yes, it's Mike Oskol. Yes, man. Jeez. Let me put the pacifier in. Get the pacifier in. Now, look, the player, if you're talking about people who played themselves out of anything, Tamori, you're playing in London. The first goal, he's at fault. He doesn't clear it. He kicks it right in the path of Fafana, a player that England fans have been saying, why isn't he playing? Serie A champion, center back. He's getting a shot. You got to do it right in your home country, and you have to be stout. You have to be resolute. Him and Torre on that left side for Milan, I thought they were woeful in the box. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dest wasn't at his best, but Dest is going to start for the U.S. men's national team. It's easy. Yeah. And he's going to start for AC Milan. This is not the type of game that's going to define him. If he plays like that in Serie A, his, his day's done. But yes, he was up against Mason Mount and Mason Mount's movement. Credit to him. A player who I thought was class on the day. His movement, whether popping inside, outside, running beyond off the shoulders between the, the two center backs or between Sergio Dest and his near side center back. That created problems. That created space for Aubameyang. And if anything, let's talk about Reese James, man. This guy is a baller. With all yep. the talk about Trent, more talk about Reese James. If no one wants to pick that right side starting position for England, put this guy in, start him. I think a performance like this, if he has another one or two in the Champions League, Scarif Southgate has got to start this guy. I think he's the real deal. He's good defensively, and you know he has the final product in the final third. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Let's just run through the goal scores here. Fafana got his first goal for Chelsea, his first ever Champions League goal. We give him credit for that one. Uh, certainly well and hard fought goal that was for Chelsea. And then Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, his first Champions League goal since 2000. Get this, and 17 when he scored for Borussia Dortmund. The assist came from James, a beautiful cross into the box. And then as you mentioned there, Michael Hood, one of the standout performers today was Rhys James. What a game, top finish. Youngest Chelsea player to score and an assist in a Champions League game at 22 years old and 301 days. What do you think about Mike's comments there, Nigel, about Reese James? I mean, he's certainly putting himself to the forefront. We talk about yesterday, Trent being the best right back in the world right now. But Reese James is having a good go at it for that title. I think there's never been a doubt about it. But again, he, the thing with Reese James is he's more solid defensively than he is, than Trent is. And he's got a great ability getting forward. The, the crosses that he can put in, the ability in the final third is fantastic, second to none. And he's also got the ability to score a goal. He's got an eye for a goal. Obviously, he's a right back, but it also reminds me of a, a great Ashley Cole in his prime when he what he could do. You know, he's one of the best left backs that we've ever produced. And I think that's the problem and dilemma that England has. And it comes down to Gareth Southgate on what players he feels to pick because he there's a tremendous amount of talent in that right back position. I've not been against him playing two right backs because of the ability that you possess and the ability to be able in, to interchange 
and have great footballing intelligence in counter-attacking situations to know where to fill in because you're naturally a right back. I think yeah. it's a great advantage. He did it once and then the British press kind of questioned it a bit and weren't really too happy about it. It's a great problem to have. And then obviously we saw yesterday Trent Alexander-Arnold's ability in dead ball situations. Um, it, is, it is a great problem. And I think Michael's right. He had a fantastic game, great delivery. And uh, it's a problem for the England manager and he has to make the decisions. Let's not forget Carl Walker also at Manchester yeah. City. He's another yeah. tremendous beast at right back. Yeah, they got a lot of options at right back position. There's no doubt about it. But a top performance from Reese James today and a massive three points from them. Um, our producer Des is wanting us to have a quick mention about AC <laughs> Milan's uh, pre-game warm-up jackets there. Mike, what was your thoughts on on this year as they're walking into the stadium? This is what they're dressed like. Thoughts here, Mike? Because I don't want to ask Nigel after seeing his horrific jacket this morning. <laughs> right, you know, it, it almost looked like the look on Rafa Leal's face Yes, the jackets are something. It's almost It almost looked like they put more effort into their wardrobe selection than they did effort on the pitch. If you're yeah. going to put a jacket like that, you have to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. That's a statement piece. Yes. Am I saying I want a size large? Absolutely. I'll send you my home address at the end of the show. But you got to back it up on the field. I think it's things like this that – Look, just wear a suit. Asking for a size a large. That's Love Michael. it. Michael, this is Italian oh, football. Go. This is Milan. I guarantee you, <laughs> I can guess right now, I guarantee you that jacket there is a collaboration with Dolce & Gabbana and AC Milan. I guarantee right. you that's a Dolce & Gabbana cal collaboration. Mm. All the Italian teams have fashion houses and fashion is a big part of Italian football and culture. So they have yeah. to dress the part. It's been going on hey. for a while. Listen, go, before go before we move on, Nigel, sorry to jump in on you. Producer Des wants to show us a little video clip that we've got here waiting. <laughs> Des, can you roll it anytime? Just roll it. Roll the clip. The return of Olivier Giroud Ooh, back to baby. the stage. Probably the in only the guy air. more handsome than both Nigel and Tomas, by the way. You guys are just fit. Olivier Giroud. Hey, I, I doubt that. I doubt that very much. <laughs> I, I try to at least have, have his hair. That's what I try. <laughs> Absolutely oh, love it from man. Tommy T this morning, by the way. Uh, Nigel Rio Coker, we got to move away from Chelsea in just a minute, but come on. I mean, Olivia Giroud looked pretty good in those horrific jackets that were walking out, by the way. <laughs> I can't imagine you would. Ooh. Don't worry about that, mate. I could pull anything off, all right? Don't worry about that. Just ask about me back in my playing days. I had a reputation oh, for my dress sense in London. Okay. Yeah, you had more, more than a reputation for your dress sense uh, from your olden days back in the playing days, by the way, Nigel. <laughs> Mike, before oh. we move on, anything else about this Milan side? Because we heard a lot from Nigel about Milan. Hmm. What about you? Were you disappointed with the way Milan performed? Because I will say this, though. This was a poor performance from a team that has been yeah. playing very well. A little bit lucky at the weekend. They scored two goals after the 19-minute mark there. But for such a talented squad, if you were going to compare them to like a Napoli, like Nigel just hmm. did do, you would have to say that Napoli don't give a shit who to play playing against Milan looked a little bit tentative in this game and I don't want to see that from Milan I think they were naive it almost looked like a team that thought they were going to go into London and just stamp their brand of football when you play on the road against the big boys in the UEFA Champions League and especially if you're a Serie A team or a team on the up and up up and one of the household names in Champions League history when it comes to this competition but as of late, they're rebuilding in this competition. I would have thought they would have maybe taken a more pragmatic approach and grown in the game. They were too expansive. But let me take you back to a moment. Right before halftime, Rafa Leal has a golden opportunity. And if I think if AC Milan get a goal against the run of play going into halftime, that plays on the nerves of Stamford Bridge. This was a must-win game for Chelsea, not for Milan. I think Milan missed a golden opportunity to really put themselves ahead of the pack in this group and put Chelsea potentially to the sword. Last one, Nigel, before we move on, because you've been pretty cr critical about Serginho Dest here. Uh, you don't rate him at all. What's your no, 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 Serginho no. Dest? Uh, I do rate him. He does have ability. I'm not going to okay. say he doesn't have. He does have ability, but he had a poor game. And again, for me, yeah. I think like like Michael said, these are the moments you need to to stand out. I'm a big fan of Rafael Leal, and I criticise him tremendously because I feel that these are the games he's supposed to stand out. Chelsea's interested in him. I'm sure loads of other top clubs are interested in this young man, but he didn't have a great game. He showed glimpses, two glimpses of what his ability is, and everyone was probably like, "Wow!" and blown back. You need to show that consistently throughout the game to let yeah. people know why you are one of the top-rated players in Europe. To a little bit, off it a bit, but for me, he reminds me a mm -hmm. bit of Mario Balotelli. 
Not in the sense of ability. I think he's got a lot more ability than Mario Balotelli. But the sense of his mannerisms. Because again, Mario Balotelli, when he wanted to play and he played, he turned it mm -hmm. on. He was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I feel Rafael Leal has that kind of same ability, but it's just when he wants to do it. And he needs people around him telling him, no, you need to do it all the time. Because if he does mm -hmm. it all the time, he'll put a case to be one of the best players in world football in the future. But he has to understand, you have to dominate games and let everyone talk about you. Don't just pick and do it and, and be happy with that. So I I, I gave him a, a lot of criticism too, and I feel that he was very disappointing. I, I like how you just actually moved away from Serginho Des and went back to Leal very quickly there because you, yes. you don't want any more criticism from US soccer <laughs> fans out there. Terrific. I will say this, though. It was a convincing uh, win for Chelsea Football Club yeah. in the group. They now move themselves closer to Salzburg, who picked up three points. And a little bit fortunately so in their game against Dinamo Zagreb. No, Okafor on the score sheet, 71 mm -hmm. minutes into the game. First half was pretty poor. Uh, Okafor, 22-year-old, scored in three consecutive Champions League games, Mike. Eight across all competitions. And I know Zagreb had that 90th-minute goal that was ruled out yeah. for offside. But at the end of the day, fair result for Salzburg, you'd have to say. It's all in the details. It's a nil-nil match until one defender falls asleep and credit to Salzburg, their dynamic movement out of midfield. And that's why they play with a narrow midfield where you have midfield runners running in advance of the front two. And one moment of madness, defender falls asleep and he tack like football tackles practically the yeah, runner. Why? And that, it's just, you don't have to do that. The ball's going over top, but the player is running away from goal. He's not running right at the goalkeeper. It's panic stations. You remember that as a player, when you're reacting, when you're lazy, when you haven't done the work early, those are the decisions you make. And it Speak costs for yourself, the Mike. That's why I said you know that. That's why I remembers that as a player. Hey, right, that's, Mike. that's why I said you know that. I never said I know that. I said you know that as a player, Ian. I never said he I does. know that. You're right, Mike. He does. <laughs> I never said that. No, but this is, a, this is a massive result, I think, for Salzburg. Okafor, in that position, the calm, the nerves of steel you have to have to put that in, knowing that you have massive games against Milan and Chelsea. If you don't put that in, that costs you the group. That potentially could put you yeah. in dire straits for your Europa League football. Because I think ultimately in this group, Salzburg, yes, could they be one of the dark horses and, and top the group or get second? Possibly. But I think Europa League is realistic. But you never know, given how woeful Chelsea have been. But Chelsea look to have reignited their Champions League campaign. Yeah, average age of this uh, Salzburg site is 22 years old. And the conveyor belt of talent, I mean, they make money. They're a business mm -hmm. for making money. And if they're good enough, they go to Leipzig and they keep them in the Red Bull system or they sell them onwards, like what you saw from Aronson moving on and going to the Premier League and getting some big money. So when a big price comes in or a big offer, they certainly take it. But I'm a fan of what Matthias Geisley is doing at Salzburg. And it's not easy because every year it's a rotation of players and young players coming in. And I will say this, Mike, as well. A lot of African players end up at this club and they do a great job of pushing the African players because I think they recognize the market and they've got a great scouting system. The market is tremendous right now for African players. They know that they can get them for incredibly cheap and sell African players on for a barrel load of money if they can perform well at Salzburg as well. So, I mean, it's got to be impressive to you as well, the fact that they continue to scout these players from all over the world. Oh, I love it. One of their marquee signings from the past Played for Liverpool at Bayern. Your best friend, your favorite team, Bayern, by the way. Well, you touched on them yesterday. We're going to continue to touch on how amazing they are, contrary to Ian's popular beliefs. But Sadio Mane came yeah. through Salzburg and then went on his way, and now he's doing big things, seemed to have found his form in Bavaria. But I, I love the conveyor belt, and I love that you use that term, conveyor belt. I'm a massive fan of African talent. I think that African talent is underappreciated throughout Europe. And to see a club like Salzburg that, that has a pipeline for players, if they're not ready to make the big jump to a top club like, I don't know, I was going to say Manchester United, but let's not talk about them. A top club that's bigger than United right now, then you have the feeder system into Leipzig next. So good things are happening in Austria. 
All right, let's move on to Group F. We'll work through this one pretty quickly. I want to get a comment from both of you about both of the games that took place in Group F, but I'll just wrap it up for you. Uh, Real Madrid with a convincing victory over Shakhtar Donetsk. Rodrigo Vinny Jr. on the score sheet. There was obviously a, a cracking uh, goal brought back by Zuboff in that game. What a great finish that was. But Vinny Jr. on fire right now. Seven goals this season, four assists to his name. Uh, 22 goals all last season and obviously scored the goal in the final as well. Real Madrid getting the victory and expected victory as well. Leipzig also got the victory against Celtic in Group F. It was a big one for them. Christopher Nkunku on the score sheet. He has been on red hot form. Nine goals already this season. He scored 35 goals last season. Also had 20 assists. And you can understand why the price is going up and up with his name. Uh, Jota pulled one back. Five goals for him on the campaign to make it 1-1. Assist from Furuhashi was sensational. Before in the second half, Andre Silva scored a double. Uh, not necessarily great for him. He hasn't scored in the Bundesliga this year, but two goals in this game. Two also in the DFB Pokal. Puts them in a, a, a decent position to potentially challenge They've got to go now to Celtic Park. But what I want, I want to give you some bad news real quickly on this game. Uh, Gulashi was forced off 11 minutes into this game. Uh, Kicker have just reported that it was an ACL injury from goalkeeper Gulashi. Looks like he is now going to be done for the season. But overall opinion and thought on Group F, Nigel, Leipzig, convincing victory, Real Madrid, business as usual. Uh, it's pretty much what I predicted anyway, so uh, I'm not really surprised. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to be boring about it. You know, I've... Uh, <laughs> Expected Real Madrid to get on. And the thing about Real Madrid is no one's really talking about Real Madrid that I've heard of and other reports. Everything is just going mm. under the radar. Everyone's mm. concentrating so much on Manchester City now, Haaland, Napoli, all these other clubs. No one's talking about Real Madrid. And I know uh, one of my favourite players at the moment, European football, Chuamini, was fantastic today as well for them. Uh, Ian's laughing, but it was pronounced yeah. correctly. You, you on the L, Chuamini. Yeah, you could do one, mate. Mini. Anyway. <laughs> um, I think for Celtic, it's, for me with Celtic, they played well and it's what we spoke about, Ian. They had yep. some chances early on in the game. If they yep. couldn't, be, if they were not clinical, they were going to get punished. And that's exactly what happened in this game. We all know goals change games. If Celtic could put the ball into the back of the net and be more clinical in these games, they'd probably find themselves in a di different situation. That's the point. Exactly. Sorry to interrupt you, but in these games, because it's easy yeah. to do it domestically in the Scottish yeah. Premiership as you watch on Paramount Plus and CBS Sports Network. It's easy to do it in the Scottish Premiership, but in the Champions League, it's a different competition altogether. Sorry, Nigel, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, they, they had the chances and they didn't take them and they got punished at the end of the day. And, and that's what I, I really expected. We, I said it early on in the, the hit with Sports HQ, so I'm not surprised. And then Real Madrid are just doing the business under the radar. So um, it, it's going to be mm. easy for Real Madrid now. I think they can rest some of their start in 11 a bit, mix up a bit, give other players, fringe players, opportunities to play games, comfortably start preparing for the next round. I would, I, I'm a bit hesitant to say and give this Real Madrid result as almost as if they walked in the park with it. I think they were relieved to get out of there 2-1. In the second half, Shakhtar was all over him. It was Shakhtar. Just, mm -hmm. and, and they were very lucky to not be 2-2. But this is what Real Madrid does. If you fall asleep, you're behind a goal, you're behind two goals, and then you're clawing your way back before you know it. You're wishing you had five more minutes. You're wishing you had two more minutes or one more minute of additional time. The the, the kid from Shakhtar, the Ukrainian winger, Modric, this kid's a player. I know he's been tied to Arsenal. Someone go get this guy. He is ready for the big time. I thought he ripped Madrid to shreds in the second half. His ability to come tuck in central or play wide as an out-and-out winger. He, he's either an attacking midfielder or a winger. I think he's more effective as a winger for Shakhtar. And I could, I, I would not be surprised if, because of him, Shakhtar ended up getting second. Going to the Leipzig game, I had a lot of fun watching that game because I saw something I never thought I'd, I would think, I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Christopher, Christopher and Cuckoo gets a pass from Tino Werner. First time all season. I was, I, I had to, Ian, I had to pause it, rewind, pause it. It was like a, a Nat Geo sort of film of like, what, what, what is that? Oh, it's a pass. They're teammates. They play to each other. Oh, that's mad. And, but what I love about Leipzig and what they're doing is their, their front, their front four, if you will, the tactical shift that they made under Marco Rose. They play in a 4-3-3. Three, three. They defend in a 4-3-3. Three, three, but when they attack, it goes into a box. Two strikers mm -hmm. and Cuckoo and Andre Silva and Werner and Sobit Sly, they tuck in as two attacking midfielders, and that creates width for the two wingbacks to get high. Now that Samaka, I thought he was excellent going forward, but defensively, that's what created gaps for Jota for Chel or Celtic. I wish Chelsea. Jota for Celtic 
to transition, and now he's running at Obron on the counter. Little tactical caveat for Marco Rose that paid off today. Mm -hmm. Ian, yeah, you're the you're the German expert. You've got your German passport on the table now. I'm sure. Please mm -hmm. explain to me what has happened to Timo Werner. From the Timo mm -hmm. Werner we saw a couple of years ago, free scoring. Everyone was talking about him, the talk of the town of, of Champions League and then Leipzig. What, what's happened to him now? Well, as I mentioned to you in our group chat, when you brought up this question, he got Thomas Tuchel probably right <laughs> in the forehead. Listen, I, I, I think it's pressure when you go to a big club like Chelsea Football Club, you're on fire. I used to call him two-time Timo because he'd always score in doubles when he was playing for Leipzig before he went over to Chelsea. And, you know, he is a selfish player and to what you've been just talking about there, Mike. He's a selfish player. He, he wants to score goals and at times he's guilty of not lifting up his head and seeing what's around him. You see him at time hitting the side net and more often than not, right? He's that type of player. Doesn't lift his head up to see what's available to him. But as a player and as a person, it's not easy to go to Chelsea and not be successful. He stopped scoring goals. At least he certainly didn't score goals at the ratio he was scoring in the Bundesliga. I thought he would do a lot better than he was doing. But at the same time, his confidence started to drop. And then, of course, the German national team, they lost a lot of experienced players and pressure was all on his shoulders for the German national team. And then all of a sudden, Germany's looking at you as well. And the media pressure in Germany is immense. So now he goes back to Leipzig. He's the one who's responsible now to try and get this club back under a new boss to winning ways. So Dealing with that pressure is not easy. Timo Werner will be okay. He will score goals. He's suited to the Bundesliga. He's suited to the style of play that Leipzig want to play. But unfortunately, to Mike's point, they've got some quality players, Leipzig, now. And they all want to share the goals. Jovas Light, fantastic today. I thought he was terrific. Um, and Christopher Nkunku, obviously, is a superstar. So he has to be able to share the goals around here. Um, but before we move on from this game, I've got to just mention to you, Joe Hart, by the way, he had an absolute oh. shock. In the game today. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm shocked we were only talking about this now. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. That, that, that's the difference. <laughs> and I know, Nigel, you, you have one question for Ian. But that's the difference for Celtic is though you can't have your goalkeeper having a shocker in the 60th minute or around that time. You, you've done well to compete. You maybe could have been ahead at different times if you had your finishing boots. You get back in the game on the road in Europe in a difficult place to play, and then your goalkeeper does that. And we were saying in the group chat, VAR, after he gives up the goal, Joe Hart does what? He raises his hand looking for VAR. There's no VAR in that one, man. It's you. It's all you. Yeah. You can't yeah. do that. Well, I mean, he'd for only me, just given up a goal and got helped by video review, by the way. Sorry, Nigel. Yeah, he gave up the goal and got helped by that. But for me, it's common sense, though. Let's be real. We've known Joe Hart is not the best with his feet. He's not a ball-playing goalkeeper. One of the reasons why Pep Guardiola got rid of him straight away. And he was England number one. He was the best goalkeeper in England at the time. Everyone loved Joe Hart. Pep Guardiola came in, analysed it, not for me, and got rid of Joe Hart. And people even raised an eyebrow at that of a quality a keeper of that quality in Pep Guardiola getting rid of him so young as well in his career. Mm -hmm. So we know he's not a, a ball-playing goalkeeper, so we shouldn't be surprised. It's the fact of Celtic encouraging him at mm -hmm. Champions League level again to try and play the ball out. As Ian said, it's not the Scottish Premier League. It's, it's a different league. My thing before we move on quickly, Ian, is are you not worried about Nkuku now going to Chelsea, rumoured to go to Chelsea, but he that he may suffer the same fate as Timo Werner? I don't know, but it's a great question. I have thought about this, Nigel. Um, obviously, Nkunku just recently signed an extension to his contract in Leipzig. And potentially, Leipzig forced him and gave him a large sum of money to do so, right? So that they can get a larger price tag for him. Um, respectfully so, because the, the figures from last year, I wrote them down here. 35 goals, 20 assists last season. I mean, these are insane numbers. These are big-time numbers. We're talking 100 million for someone like that who scores goals in that magnitude, especially in the Bundesliga, where it's difficult. But also for young players, they seem to enjoy themselves scoring goals there. So confidence is flying high. He's now involved with the French national team. If they have a run in the World Cup, who knows what his price tag could be if he gets a shot to potentially play more minutes than he has been playing with the French team. But being involved in that French squad will help him. And I think the fact that he's in that French squad really helps him be involved with, with what Chelsea are doing as well. So he's close to Paris, where he obviously he uh, came through the ranks of PSG and then was sold on to Leipzig. I think you're going to see him in the big city really recognizing the big lights and turn it on. I am a fan, and I mean mm -hmm. a big fan of what Christopher Ngunku is as a player, as a personality. He's a good human as well. From all the interviews I've, I've watched him, he is a proper player, he's a proper guy. So he's, I think he's going to do well, Mike. Quick, real quickly on this one before we move on, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I, I thought he was just the maestro of the game. On the third goal, the one of the goals, it was his driven ball. He gets it at midfield. His ability to pick up his head and just drive a ball to Samaka on the far side. Samaka cuts it back for Andre Silva to have a tap in. Silva was putting out one of your cigars, Nigel, before he put the ball in the back of the net. But that that's just world class. That's not a good or great player. That's world class. I think he's getting to that level. He's the heart and soul yeah. of the Leipzig team. And remember, it was his form that got Leipzig the German Cup last year. And I think he's ready for the next stage in his career. Yeah, to answer your question real quickly, he is, in my opinion, a better player than Timo Werner ever could have dreamed of dreamt of being because he's mm. got more to his, his game than what Timo Werner has got. Timo Werner's got pace. He's actually a decent finisher. He's not a great finisher. He's a decent finisher, but he's not adaptable enough. Like Nkunku's more adaptable. He can play multiple positions up front, uh, left, right, through the middle. You can drop off behind the striker if he needs to. He's adaptable. He can play around. But the Premier League's a big question. As you know, Nigel, playing in the Premier League is, is a completely different animal, but in the Champions League... Seems to be enjoying himself right now. So there you have it. Top of Group F right now is Real Madrid on the nine points. Shakhtar on four points. Leipzig on three points. And Glasgow Celtic, unfortunately, sitting on the one point. We're going to take a quick break, but stay with us. When we return, we'll have a look at all of Wednesday's Champions League games. The rest of them, including Messi, on the score sheet again. The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. That's brilliant! With more magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nails the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. Oh, so stream every switch, so second of regulation time, stoppage time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent! This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus. Welcome back to Kick a Lot. So it's Ian Joy alongside Michael LaHood and Nigel Rio Coker. Every time I see that Paramount Plus commercial there, it gets me excited because these games are coming thick and fast. Today was no different. Match day three of Wednesday slates. Group G saw a battle at the top. Obviously, Manchester City trying to extend their lead. 100% record already was never going to be in question against Copenhagen. Erling Haaland once again on the score sheet. And Alvarez on the score sheet to wrap things up. Nigel, really quickly on that game. You're a fan of his. You like it. You've covered him for a while now, huh? Yeah, covered him at River Plate. I didn't really think he'll uh, have the impact that he's had so far, but he's doing very, very well. You know, I think the more run of games he gets, the more problems he'll be. Really, really is a good finisher. And I'm sure being at Manchester City as well, with the level of quality of players that he's training with, the world-class players, he's probably raised his game. You know, I'm sure he's learned a lot from the likes of the other players around him, especially even Haaland as well, where he's mm -hmm. taken his game to another level. And um, he's definitely a player for the future. A real good buy by Manchester City. Great bit of business. <laughs> For the long-term future. Mike, That's a creepy photo there. I don't know why our producers put that picture there. That looks very creepy. Yeah, well, I, I was going to jump in, but I knew Nigel was going to two-foot me in with that Pep Guardiola uh, photo. <laughs> what I, what, a, a player that I was watching in this match, and I'm glad you said Alvarez, but Jack Grealish, last two matches, I think okay. he's found his feet. Right. He So much criticism his way. The big transfer fee, I'm, I'm Jonathan Johnson would be I don't even know what his reaction would be seeing Jack Grealish play. I think memories of him in that Claret and Blue Villa kit that you have in your closet, Nigel, very so much. But what I love about Grealish is he's finding his space centrally. In this city attack, you have wingers who are actual attacking midfielders and center midfielders who have the freedom to move out wide. And there's just this interchangeability because you have the focal point that is Holland. And for Jack Grealish, passes once Alvarez came in, and for a player of his quality, it's so easy to look around and say, oh, okay, Kevin De Bruyne is not here. Okay, Haaland's off now. Let me drop my quality. But I saw him put together another complete match. I thought he had a complete game in the time he was on the field in the Manchester's Derby, and it's another complete game from him, one to keep an eye on moving forward. Yep. Mike, do you think Pep's had to eat a bit of a little bit of a mm. quiet pie, so to speak, in the sense of he's giving Jack Grealish a bit more freedom than he normally would like or like in players in his system. Do you think that that is why Jack is playing the way that he is? That he's letting Jack have that more freedom? That's that's a great question. I look at preseason. Jack Grealish, when Manchester City were trying to, how do we implement having a true number nine? Jack Grealish, remember, was the one that got an assist in Michigan. I think or University of Michigan at the big house. He was the one that got to the end line and cross the ball to Holland. He didn't even think twice about it. He didn't try to kill de death by 10,000 passes. He put his head down, 
and got it to the big center forward. We've seen him do that before with England. And if I'm Pep Guardiola, I'm thinking, okay, if this young man can do it with Harry Kane, who's a proven goal scorer, maybe let me release the chains a little bit and give him that sort of freedom that Gareth Southgate seems to give him when he's come in for England and roams around because you know he has that quality to adjust his game to get the ball centrally centrally to play like Holland. Great comment right here coming from Oscar. Hey, guys, don't get high on Manchester City because until they (laughs) actually win the trophy, they're still sus. All right. Oscar, you're so right. right. All right, let me add you here a couple of statistics that I got hammered for. Apparently, I got it wrong the last time, but I'm certainly not getting it wrong this time because I've done my homework yeah. completely here. Uh, Erling Haaland, 22 years old, 28 Champions League goals from only 22 games, by the way. This is absolutely insane numbers from a player who's got off to such a flying start at Manchester City. Could any of any of us even predicted this? We thought he'd score goals, but not at this magnitude, Nigel. I mean, it's hard to score goals. It's hard to even play in the Premier League, let alone score goals, man. Like I said, I, I thought that he'd do well, but not this well like he's phenomenal he really is a talent and the thing about him is he knows where the goal is he's a natural born Mm -hmm. finisher it's not Mm -hmm. just his athleticism that he's relying on no he's a natural born finisher knows where to put the ball where he is in around the goal his movement is fantastic i've been so impressed with his movement you know you don't really realize until you watch him when he pulls out and runs in front of the defenders then the athleticism just to top that is absolutely phenomenal uh i just what more can you say about him really and truly he's the man of the moment and it goes just a little comparison of what I'm saying about how Haaland is relishing it. He wants to score goals. He's enjoying it. He's smiling. Like he's loving scoring goals and having hat tricks. It goes to what I'm saying about that same desire is what someone needs to install in Rafael Leal because he has the ability. It's just not, not like Haaland. Same- no, no, not like Haaland. No, no, no. Like he does that. I won't, I won't say, no, I'm not saying like Haaland to score goals. I'm saying mm. the ability to be the main man in the game where right. everyone's talking about that kind of ability yeah. to over, to really take over a game. But right. he doesn't have that individual personality, the outliner that Haaland does. Because Haaland loves to score goals, wants to score hat-tricks and having fun. Rafael Leal turns it on now and then. But you can't doubt his ability. And then just to add to the stat that I have, this is what we mm. always talk about so people are listening. The Go. importance of history in the Champions League. Since 1997, when Ian's beloved Dortmund scratched their name on the trophy, Mm-hmm. Only one new club has scratched their name on the trophy, while the trophy's only been won by clubs who've constantly or persistently won the trophy. There's only been one more is. new addition. Go on. One more new? Yeah. FC Porto. Nope. Chelsea. Ah. Chelsea. I don't know who that is. Only latest right. new addition. To You're win right. the Champions League, while yeah. every other club that's won it has won it before. Ninety-seven, okay. and then Dortmund was the late. Dortmund was the last new team to win the Champions League. Yeah, uh, in ninety-seven. Well, Mike, so just wrap it up. Of history. Yeah, to, to to round off, and I love that stat, Nigel. To, to round off how brilliant Holland is, I, I go back to our producer Des Norris was saying, talk about the second goal, talk, and I love that because Erlen Holland is left-footed, and. When you're a striker who's in form, everything you touch goes in the back of the net because you have anticipation. You see plays that could be. You gamble on things that could be where players and strikers who are out of form or lacking confidence don't. They're flat-footed. On that second goal, the ball comes off of a volley. He has no business getting on the end of that. But when everyone is running away from goal thinking, ah, the goalkeeper's ha- goalkeeper has it or it's going to get blocked, He's anticipating, thinking, what if this, what if this ball pops out? What if, the, what if and because he does, he taps it in with his weaker right foot. That is yep. an example of a player who is just like that nose for goal. He's just at a different superhuman level. Cannot wait does, to see him in the knockout round. Does he have a weak foot? I mean, does he have a weakness to <laughs> yeah. his game? I mean, yeah, that would be the question right now. I mean, I'm gonna ask this out to the people who mm. are watching along here, right? Is there a weakness to Erling Haaland's game? I mean, obviously, with the goals that he's scoring right now, you can recognize he's scoring with his head, he's scoring with his left, scored with his right today, left and right today. It was incredible. But exactly explain to me if you've got a comment, drop it in there and let us know where his weakness is. But N- Nigel, is there is there a freaking weakness? There is no weakness. The only criticism that you get is he doesn't have many touches of the ball. But that's the danger, because when the moment comes, he'll put it into the back of the net. So he doesn't get involved in play, doesn't really get involved in intricate play and linking up and stuff. But when it comes to putting in the back of the net, that's what he does. And that's what he's paid for. That's the only thing you could really say you can criticise him of if you want to be a, 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 a footballing playing manager. But Pep Guardiola, 
has got him to work within the system where you don't need him to get involved. Do your business in the end where Manchester City feel they've been lacking since Aguero is gone. And now they've got someone that's just superhuman. And mm. really, I can't see any weaknesses in his game. Yeah, All right. I, I, there is one weakness. He plays for Manchester City. And that's oh, my God. Get over it. Get <laughs> I over can't. it. I can't. Okay. Listen, I, can't. I, I, I have to be careful what I say on this one. You know, employee at City Football Group, you know, I just have to be very careful what I say about this one. But <laughs> I, I'm a huge fan of Erling Haaland. I've been fortunate enough to watch him play, you know, since he's a young boy and to watch him grow into this animal. And actually, he was this clinical when he was mm. like 16, 17 years old. I mean, he's still only, what, 22 years old. And the goals that he scored, I mean, I could bring all the goals off for you. Just go have a look at his statistics. They're just absolutely sensational. Well, boys, we've got some breaking news on the show today. You're watching Kegel Lat, so it's Ian Joy alongside Michael LaHood and Nigel Rio Coker. We're going to move on to our other game in Group G. Uh, Fabrizio Romano reported this, uh, what, 20 minutes ago. Julian Lopetegui will be sacked, but he's also just reported two minutes ago that it is official. It is confirmed. Julian Lopetegui has been sacked. He is no longer Sevilla manager. Uh, Fabrizio, thank you to you as always for updating us with the latest news and greatest news. And this time, not so great for Sevilla. This was probably news already going into this game. Um, but an absolute hammering that Sevilla took today against Borussia Dortmund. Guerrero on the score sheet. Jude okay. Bellingham, captain in Borussia Dortmund today. The youngest English captain ever in the Champions League, by the way. Third youngest ever. Uh, incredible performance from him. He had an assist and a goal. Karim Adeyemi on the score sheet. And Julian Brand also on the score sheet. I mean, this was uh, a bit of embarrassment from Sevilla. Lopetegui now sacked. What are your thoughts, Mike? About damn time. This guy was on borrowed time. I thought they should have sacked him maybe a few games ago. And you're only you're only as good as you truly are, really. You, you can't fake it. Your players will expose you as a manager if they don't want to play for you. And this Sevilla team looked like they did not want to be on the field. They looked like they did not believe in the setup anymore. And the last couple of games, I saw Ivan Rakitic, who was the darling of Sevilla, on the bench. And that tells me he's lost the locker room well before this match. And Dortmund hammered them. They had a point to prove given their recent loss in the Bundesliga at the weekend. And they came out flying. Just some of the goals, some of the defensive frailties of Sevilla, not getting tight to your man. When you're at home, the crowd behind you, that's something that's almost like having a 12th man. It seemed like they were mortified to play in front of that crowd to be exposed. And for Borussia Dortmund, this was a Jude Bellingham show. The first goal, he, he played as an attacking midfielder for one of the first times I've seen him. Gives me something phenomenal. to think about. For England, could he be higher up the field? His athleticism, dynamic play, dropping a shoulder, and his ability to accelerate past players. But the vision, the awareness, the, the, just the tactical awareness of where to exploit space. He had a free roll. He dropped off that back line, that deep back line of Sevilla, and then pinged the ball with his weaker left foot across to Guerrero for the first goal. And then the second goal put the defender on skates and had the awareness and just the ingenuity to hit it with the outside of his foot with the onrushing goalkeeper. This kid is a star in the making, if not a star already. Love this guy. I don't really have to add much. I think Mike really covered it all and summed it all. I think it was a fantastic performance by Dortmund. Um, Jude Bellingham again, raising these stocks. For me, I personally feel that I hope he goes to Real Madrid. I really do. I think that Real Madrid will be the perfect setting for that. Why, why though? Explain that to me. Why Real Madrid and not go to like a Liverpool right Liverpool. now? Or Liverpool, Liverpool or is the league. one team that wants or United. And I know or Chelsea United. interested as well. But for me, I feel that Real Madrid is, is, is where it needs to be. It's a, it's a mm. great rebuild. It's consistently competing for league titles and it's going to be consistently competing for Champions League titles. You look at that young core of players they've got there. Fabulous. That's a team that's mm. going to be absolutely sensational for four or five years. And let's not forget, the Mbappe to Real Madrid is not fully over. Don't be fooled. Mbappe yep. to Real Madrid is going to happen. And I feel for me, that is the best team to go for four or five years. Because even when you leave Real Madrid in, you could go, to, the world is still your oyster. You could go from Real Madrid to still Manchester United and they're still supposed yeah. to be a big club in the world. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in, in, incredible fire. point. <laughs> Great point, though. Great point though. I mean, listen, no, at I the end of the day, anything. you got a question as to where he's going to go. He's going to have to make a big choice here because everyone's going to want to sign this kid. The price mm -hmm. tag will be exactly what it's all about here. Um, but Jude Bellingham, I, I got a little stat for you here. He became the first midfielder in UEFA Champions League history to score in three consecutive appearances while still mm. being a teenager. We forget that he's still such a youngster. Captain of Borussia Dortmund, they absolutely love this kid. And I want to say this, right? When you watch his style of play, Nigel, you'll probably remember this more than Mike, Mike will because we're a bit older. But 
he reminds me of an old school, like a, an 80s sort of player, like 80s or 90s. He doesn't give two shits what the coach Listen, is saying. He's, he's gone. Him. If he wants to go he's, forward, he's gone. He's one of the few players in this generation that could have played in our mm. generation. His mentality and how he is, and the fact yeah. he's captain of Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League at that young age, yeah. tells you about him. You only give that kind of responsibility to players who could have played in the older generation. Because to take that responsibility on, that burden of being a captain of such a big club, it's not easy. But he yeah. does it, and he does not care about who he's coming up against. And that's what I love about him. That's what Ian's right about. He has that attitude. He does not care who he's coming up against. His mentality is going to be, I don't care who you are, but I'm going to make sure you remember my name more yeah. than I have to remember your name. And that's love that. he's, he's like a coach out there on the pitch, right? He's bossing people around. He's a teenager, but he's bossing people around. You must not forget how many games he's played, right? He's 19 mm. years old, but he's already played yeah. over 150 league games. I mean, this is insane numbers for a kid. Now he's scoring goals for Borussia Dortmund as well. They'll need him at the weekend. Big game against uh, Bayern Munich. So watch out for the classic. Last weekend. one quickly, Ian. Just go ahead. You should know that. Hasn't there been a change at Leverkusen as well? Yep. Yes. Yep. Leverkusen. Oh, big one. Great appointment. Obviously, they lost yesterday against Porto. So, obviously, we just had the breaking news there that Lopetegui has been fired um, as Sevilla manager. And, and rumors are that Sampaoli will be the one who replaces him as boss there. And Lopetegui's been linked to many, many jobs as well, even before he got fired, including the Wolves job. But yeah, Leverkusen made a change this morning. We were on HQ when the news broke there that they had, uh, let's say, Owani leave and it was coming. Leverkusen have not been playing well this season. Port in the Bundesliga, second bottom, if I'm not mistaken, in the Bundesliga right now and also lost i think they lost also against video review against porto yesterday but yep. javi alonso has been appointed the new boss at leverkusen yeah, so mm. that was breaking news for us right there so there you have it join in the conversation with us as well let us know exactly what you think there tom mark and then he says love bailing um he reminds me of brian robson what a shout. what a great one that's yeah. a great shout right there another player that's a, player. Yeah, that's a good one. another player who didn't give a shit by the way it went forward <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sorry for my language today. I'm getting a little bit excited. The Champions League does that for me today, but you're watching Kego Lats alongside Mike, uh, Michael LaHood, Nigel Rio Coker, I am Ian Joy. We're going to move on to Group H, and uh, we got a lot to talk about. So please join in the discussion. Please let us know your feelings on Paris Saint Germain's performance against Benfica Ooh. today. I expected there to be a lot of goals today. Uh, didn't necessarily turn out to be the case between these two clubs here. Leo Messi scored his 127th, I think, goal in the Champions League. Not bad for him, an own goal. <laughs> Made it 1-1. One, one. Uh, but let's talk about this one, Nigel. I mean, is this a fair result? I mean, at the end of the day, they took Messi off in the 80th minute. I'm trying to figure out why. Hmm. I think for me, I don't know what Michael thinks, but I personally think Paris Saint-Germain are lucky not to lose this game. I thought Benfica hmm. were absolutely sensational. And it goes to say when I've always still questioned Paris Saint-Germain defensively, and today is a prime example of why. You know, Benfica were well and truly in this game. Paris Saint-Germain left themselves too exposed at times, creating loads of chance, giving loads of chances to Benfica. And if they were just a bit more clinical, I think that they would have definitely lost this game. You know, again, it's too mm. much reliance on the superstar three of uh, Messi and Bappe and Neymar. And then you take Messi off as well. It's, 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 it's a tough one. And again, it, it goes to say that whole Paris Saint-Germain thing, there's always going to be something that cooks up eventually. It's great when they're winning. We all know what yeah. it's like. When you're in a winning team, you can cover the cracks because you're winning. Mm. All the little things that you should pay attention to, you don't. But as soon as results start to become indifferent and then start to change, the whole atmosphere changes, then all those cracks start to become bigger because you don't want to address it. So that I think for me, there's going to be something that happens again soon with whether it's it's the whole Messi and, and well the whole Mbappe and Neymar thing and everything like that. But again, I think that it just shows still how vulnerable defensively Paris Saint-Germain are. And when they play that top 1% team with some top strikers or some top goal scorers, they against will be... The kind city, of... Against the city, city you've got no chance with this defense. Oh, they've right? got no chance. No, they've got no, no. chance against the city. Well, that, that's interesting you say that, Ian, because I think the arrogance of PSG got exposed a bit today. Prior to this game, they were defending with two midfielders in Vitinha and Marco Verratti and saying... Everyone else get forward. We're going to maybe defend with five sometimes at four. This Benfica team, Rafa Silva, oh, he and Messi were going tit for tat for who the best player on the field was. Rafa Silva, the 90th minute, he's still running players ragged. Blew by Sergio Ramos as if he, Ramos was still in a wheelchair. This guy is a baller. Ramos, a handful, exposed the fact that Danilo, of course it had to be Danilo, former FC Porto player who gets, I think that was an own goal, who gets the last touch on the ball because he's not a center back. You're going to go to play the group, the team that's leading your group. 
with a player who's not a central defender, you're going to get exposed for it in the Champions League. I think PSG, If you, the, the, when I was watching this game, the team I was thinking of, and I was saying, you know what? I wonder if they're going to watch this and say, that's how we get them. That's how we beat them. Marseille. If you're Olympic Marseille, you'll say, okay, they've shown their vulnerability. We play them in a few weeks' time, and that's going to be a cracking game on the 16th of October. It's like Derby Day everywhere. And I, I just I can't wait for that because – I think for PSG, them being held accountable and, and their their character being tested, it's going to be the thing that's going to be the best thing for them or the thing that breaks them. That's where we'll yeah. find out who they really are. For Benfica, I still think they're the best team in this group. I think they'll top the group. If if they don't, it'll be goal differential or some head-to-head Ooh. thing. Yeah, I'm again, a believer Mike, in this you team. Best team in the group? I think they're the best team in the group. Right now, yeah. I think they're the, not with the best Nigel. players. I think they're the best team in the group. They're playing the best football in the group right now. I would have to Nigel. agree with it. I, I still have my, my reservations on PSG because I still just don't see a team. I see uh, a collective of fantastic players and obviously th- the, the best front three in world football probably, but they're not a team. You still need to get them to gel as a team and have that team dynamic. I think Napoli are a better team than Paris Saint-Germain. And like Mike said, I think Benfica look like a better team than Paris Saint-Germain. I don't know why Ian's laughing for. It's probably because I didn't say Bayern Munich. My I mean, words, you're turning into Diego no. Maradona, you, the way you talk about Napoli. Hey, Napoli, unbelievable. Listen, it was a great performance all around from Benfica today. And I will say, touch upon this one on Rafa Silva. I think he only misplaced one pass in the yeah. whole game, by the way. Class. He was just incredible. Um, but Benfica are doing themselves just the world of good here. We're seeing a lot of comments coming in. So keep those comments coming in. One comment coming in from Rafa just a moment ago saying that PSG are in cruise control. It will all be decided in Paris and next week as to who will top the group. So I absolutely agree with that. But now a moment ago saying that, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for giving Benfica some credit and telling us exactly exactly who they are they're a great side they they're got some team. talent man they got proper and as, as mike you touched upon it they're a team they're not a team of individuals they're not a, a group of players that are playing for themselves how about they're this a team... go ahead ian sorry how about this if they had nunez oh. in today's game he might be better been, he might be better nunez in today's game they yeah. would yeah. be in paris saint germain yeah but they're a selling club and you must not forget that one no, and of course that. When one goes out, one comes in. Neres comes into this team from Shakhtar, and look how good he is. What a great addition he is to that squad as well. So a lot of credit to them. Um, A little stat that I found on Messi before we move on from Paris Saint-Germain and talk a little bit about Juventus here. Messi has played against 44 opponents in the Champions League. He has scored against how many of them, Nigel? 40, 42. 40 of them. He has played Ooh. against 110 teams in club football. Mike, how many teams has you scored against? You know, my math is going to be a little scraggly. Um, uh, 99. Very close. He scored against 92 of them there. Ah. And uh, we have to also add here, PSG have conceded one away goal in the last 11 Champions League away games. So away from home, they are a little bit suspect. A draw might not be a bad result. Let's see who the best team is next week in Group H when they face off in Paris. The other game in the group was Juventus trying to get um, points on the board today. It took them a while, but they eventually got points on the board. We'll keep it quickly talking about Juventus against Maccabi Haifa. 3-1 win. Rabio with a couple of nice goals today. Uh, his first goal in 50 games for Juve today. That guy, some guy called Vlahovic, he was on the score sheet as well. <laughs> Mike, what was your thoughts on uh, Juventus? We're going to keep this one quick. The difference between Juventus losing this game and Juventus winning by the scoreline, Angel Di Maria. He was unavailable through injury for about a month or so, or maybe just over a month. And that's why they brought him in. Some of his passes, this guy is Benjamin Button. He gets better with age, like fine wine outside like the Nigel. foot, inside of. No, I didn't say Nigel. I said Di Maria. <laughs> <laughs> some of his assists, the Vlahovic assist outside of the boot, left boot, right in his running lane. And Vlahovic, for a split second, I thought when he got the happy feet going, I thought, oh my gosh, Ian's going to hammer him. I know Nigel's always going to hammer him. Ian's going to absolutely hammer his boy on K. Golasso today, but he scores. You know, it's almost like the movie Mighty Ducks with the guy, was it Luis Mendoza who run, who's skating? To, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, he stopped. I thought, oh my gosh, Vlahovic scored. That doesn't happen, but Angel Di Maria was the difference. For a split second, though, I know th- w- those of you who watched the game and you two who watched it, I thought they were going to bottle it. When it was 2-1 and Maccabi Haifa scored the goal, Great I goal, thought, by the oh, way. my gosh, here we go. It's done. But Di Maria to the rescue. 
I think Juventus had to get the job done. If they didn't, then it would be super alarm bells going on there. There probably could have been a riot in the stadium, which wouldn't have been great. But again, let's pay attention. There's loads of empty seats in that stadium. Loads of empty seats. And for a club like Juventus, that's still not a good sign. But like Mike said, you know, he covered pretty much everything that I, I probably would have said as well. They, they, For me, they had to get the win. There was nothing else about it. I don't even think performance really even mattered. They just had to get this win for the sake of the players and the management. Yeah, also to give them a chance in Group H yeah. because of that yeah. draw. I mean, the draw is not a good result for Juve uh, between PSG and Benfica because they both move up to seven points apiece. Now, Juve sit on three points, Maccabi Haifa also on zero points. Another chance for Juve to pick up maximum points against Maccabi Haifa next week. That's going to be a massive game for them. But if you heard today, and our producer Des, who needs a microphone, by the way, so he can join in this <laughs> conversation, he's also letting us know that Chesney had a moment of madness for the goal against, which Din David scored the goal here to make it 2-1. Before Rabiot scored that first goal, I don't know if you heard it, Juve fans were booing in the stadium. They were booing mm, yep, Juve. Yep, yeah. I've got one for you, Mike, though, before we head out of here. Uh, you had mentioned the performance from Di Maria, his 34th Champions League assist since he has played a Champions League game. I think he made his debut back in 2007 or 9. I'm not sure which one it was. There's only one player who has more assists in the Champions League than Di Maria. Which player is it, Mike? Oh, is he also from Argentina? He is. Lena Messi. Well done. Great yeah. job. My, so Nigel always, Luke, always an easy guess. <laughs> Nigel looks confused by that one. Almost <laughs> yeah, right. confused. He almost looked as confused as Thomas Rongen this morning on oh, CBS. Jesus. <laughs> Listen, producer Des, before we get out here, um, we, we've got to get the conversation coming in from a lot of our viewers out there before yeah. we get out, especially the ones who are watching on YouTube. Can you put that picture up once again or, or that video up once again? <laughs> of Nigel Rio Coker on um, CBS Sports HQ again this morning. For me, it was uh, eye-opening. He comp oh, compared himself gosh. to Olivier Giroud. He was wearing uh, Michael Jackson's, by the way, jacket. I'm surprised he didn't have a white glove on as well on one hand. <laughs> I did. You just couldn't see it. <laughs> Boys, return of Olivier Giroud. Here we go. Ooh, Ooh, baby. Probably the In only the guy more handsome than both Nigel and Thomas, by the way. <laughs> you guys the just fit Olivier Giroud. Hey, I, I doubt that. I doubt that very much. <laughs> I, I try at least to have, have his hair. That's what I try. <laughs> <laughs> Ian loves oh, that one, doesn't he? Oh, man. Listen, if you are not wearing that jacket when you come to New York for this event, I'll be oh, very, very disappointed. Uh, just a reminder for everybody I out there. Bring that out, it's too much of a statement piece. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't bring that to New York. The Paramount Plus team will be in Brooklyn Bridge Park. You can uh, obviously watch the craziness. We'll also be maybe making an attendance or two and uh, watch out for us in the after hour show around New York City because Nigel Rio Coco is going to be rocking up with that jacket <laughs> on and cigar hanging out of his mouth. Uh, final thoughts before we get out of here. What a crazy uh, Champions League match day this has been. Uh, club football comes back this weekend, but real quickly, let's talk about the schedule. These guys are being asked mm. to play a lot. Erling Haaland taken off, I think, at halftime in the game today. A little bit crazy, but final thoughts on what we've witnessed from match day three. Mike, you go. I love the competitive nature. And yes, we're, we're hammering some of the teams and being critical, but I love Chelsea's group. Who would have thought that Chelsea would be playing for their lives and got a massive win? I think Juventus. Some of these storylines, one to keep an eye on, but they're also unfolding, not just in Europe, but in the club season. This could be the most interesting club season in a long while because the World Cup is also around the corner. Every game matters. Cannot wait. Uh, just the amount of games is crazy. It really is. And we've got to always remember that these players are humans. They're not robots. And it does play a part. But I like the, the fact that some managers are using their brain and resting certain players and taking them off and protecting these players because it's going to be a long season. It's an indifferent season. We have a uh, World Cup in Christmas and that's going to play a part. And the transfer window also is going to play a part domestically to how these teams do. Can I just give you a little scary thought here before we get out of here? Mm. one player will not be in the World Cup and will be rested for the return of club football. Who is that player? Nigel. Haaland. Erling Haaland, baby! Haaland. He's going to be... <laughs> he's going to be absolutely fired oh, up for the... Absolutely Our fired. producer just said Mo Salah, but Mo Salah... Yeah, I was going to say Mo Salah as well. Shooting boots. Hey, yeah, yeah, he's not I really can tell you right yet. now... Yeah, Erling Haaland is going to be the first one on the beach. He'd be sitting by the pool for a month watching these players all run their balls off. And then all of a sudden, he's the one who's <laughs> firing back into it when club football returns. Boys, awesome stuff as always. Thank you so much for uh, 
your efforts these past couple of days and this past week. Everybody out there, make sure you tune in to our show tomorrow. Okay, Golatza will be back as we preview the weekend's big games that are coming up. And there are some massive games as club football returns this weekend, not just on the Champions League, of course, but also in their domestic campaigns. But thanks too much to everybody out there for watching Kegel Lats. So please make sure you take a minute and leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast. We're also, unfortunately for Nigel, available on video. So subscribe <laughs> to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com forward slash Kegel Lazzo and make sure Nigel Rio Coker never ever wears that jacket again. Thanks everybody <laughs> for watching. Another one. Don't worry about that. We'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.